Hi, I'm Rick Dior. Today we're going to start a series on cleaning and maintaining drums. So this will be a multi-part series. I'll try to do a video here and there when I have time. Also when I'm repairing something or cleaning something so I can show you how I do that. Now as many of you know, I have lots and lots of drums and lots of snare drums. Uh, probably around 85 at last count. A few I can't find. I don't know where I put them. But uh, these are two of, of my favorite drums. And these are black nickel. So uh, that's one of my favorite finishes. Pretty much is my favorite finish. In fact, when I had Doc Sweeney do some uh, snare drums for me, they did uh, black nickel uh, rims and hardware, which is beautiful. And that's the drum that you see me playing on most of my drum set videos. So anyway, uh, these are two black nickel drums. This, as all of you probably know, is a Ludwig Black Beauty. It's a 90th anniversary um, recreation. So it's got some years on it now. It was engraved by John Aldridge and it's number seven. So this is a beautiful drum and uh, it's, it's, it sounds great, really. It's kind of, to me, it's sort of a superphonic on steroids. And this drum right here is a Steve Ferroni. I think this was made in the 90s. I don't make these anymore. It's a Pearl Steve Ferroni um, edition drum. Uh, some people say Steve Ferrone. I stay, say Steve Ferroni. Uh, a great drummer, obviously plays with uh, Clapton. And I first heard him when I was a kid playing with Chaka Khan on a recreation of uh, A Night in Tunisia, which is really an amazing track if you want to look that up. So anyway, I, I love this drum. And at the time uh, uh, that I discovered these drums, I felt like they were kind of a copy of a Black Beauty because I couldn't afford one at the time. And so I, I got one, you know, and I have a few of these and I, I checked it out and it sounded great, like amazing actually. And so, uh, you know, whereas sometimes I get snare drums and I sell them if I don't like them. This one, I, hold on, I held on to. In fact, I, I just bought another one recently. So I have a couple. I have a spare. So this drum is in dire need of cleaning, as is this drum. Not dire, but, you know, I like to keep these clean. Now, one of the best ways that you can keep a drum from oxidizing or, you know, just basically uh, having some problems that, are harder to fix down the road is to clean them regularly and I use several products for this and what we're going to do today is walk through those products and then I will take these drums apart you know obviously we'll pause the camera because you don't want to see me do that and I'll show you the bare shell and how I clean the bare shell so first uh, I want to put these drums down here so they don't resonate when I'm talking and also so I don't damage them in some way Okay, so let's start with, with what I use to clean drums. There's a lot of different products you can use. So many, really. It's hard to count. You can, you can use things like Windex and any kind of glass cleaner. Problem with those is they have alcohol in them. And they have other chemicals, too, that could harm a finish if it's a fragile finish. Especially a finish like black nickel. The number one thing you always have to look out for is scratching. So if you use any kind of abrasive cleaner or any kind of abrasive rag, you're going to scratch the drum. And there might be little finite scratches that you can't really see, but eventually those scratches will add up. And, you you know, the drum won't shine like it did. I want to put some of these towels on these drums so they stop resonating when I'm talking. Okay, and speaking of towels, these are microfiber cloths, and these, these have become really common in the last... 15, 20 years or so, and they're really cheap. You can get a pack of eight on Amazon for like five bucks. I like the thinner ones because you can really, you know, get some elbow grease into it. And the other thing I like to use to clean drums is a cloth called chamois. It's spelled like chamois, and people use them to clean their cars. It really holds a lot of water or whatever chemical you're using to clean. And uh, these are a little more expensive. They're genuine sheepskin. Is That's what you want to use, the best ones. They're unbelievably soft, too. All right? And you can clean them. So they have a lot of really good uses. And really, as a general rule, anything that's good for cleaning the finish on a car is going to be most likely good for cleaning a drum. All right? Uh, not everything, but the things we're going to talk about today, I actually use them on my car as well. So uh, my all-time favorite cleaning products for drums 
are these two things. This is a Meguiar's Mirror Glaze. It's number 26. It's still available. Uh, the um, bottle might look a little different. I have a whole bunch of this, and I have a whole bunch of bottles. I haven't checked recently. It's not expensive. Uh, and I go through a lot of this, okay? Again, I do use it to clean my car. One thing about it, it smells like bananas. So if you don't like the smell of bananas or, you know, it goes away eventually, but you don't want your drugs to smell like bananas, you may not want to use this. But I think, hands down, this is pretty much the best thing for cleaning all parts of the drum. So if you're going to buy one thing, this is what you're going to get. It works on hardware. It definitely works on the shells, uh, any kind of wrap or even finish. It's just really gentle, especially when you're using a microfiber cloth or a, a sheep skin um, chamois uh, kind of cloth. It works great. So that's what I use, all right? Bananas don't bother me, so I can use it. The next thing that I'd recommend for your hardware is a product uh, called Mothers. It's basically a wheel polish. And again, I just got a new one because I was out of my old stuff. So I got a new one to show you guys. So this is what the new ones look like. I'm positive because I just bought it. And not really much of a smell there. So you don't have to worry about that too much. And this stuff is great for cleaning hardware. It doesn't have a lot of chemicals. So you don't have to worry about it harming things or causing any kind of oxidation or anything. So these are kind of my go-to cleaning products that I pretty much use for everything. They're cheap. They're available. I mean, these have both been on the market for many years. So uh, this is what I use now. Now, in the old days, I used a thing called Never Dull. Uh, one thing I did find out about using this, first of all, it's a little bit toxic. Uh, this is going to be hard to open because I haven't opened it in a while. There we go. And it has these rags, and it's a very strong smell. So you want to be careful. It's combustible, so don't smoke around it. Uh, I've heard stories about drummers smoking cigarettes and then, you know, just basically catching on fire. I don't know if they're true, but don't do that. Okay, so there's, you know, this is basically a silverware polish. Use it on anything. Uh, I do not use this anymore, just so you know. It does remove rust uh, from chrome. It will do that. It's got a little bit of abrasive built into it. So uh, I'm going to show you how to get rid of that in a second. There's two ways to do it, but this is one way. So if you have a bad rim, like I took one out, like this is the old die cast rim that I'm going to clean today. Maybe I'll show you that. It needs some work. And I might use some of this to get rid of the tough spots that, you know, just a little bit of staining. And, you know, this can even take out really, really mild scratches, but it can cause scratches too, especially on black nickel. So be really careful. So I do use this on occasion, but not much anymore. Now, the last thing you can use, and it's really handy, is this stuff called Gugon, all right? Again, a strong chemical. This stuff is poison. It could really be bad if you're in a room with it, like, for hours on end and you're cleaning. So you want to have some airflow, all right? Uh, not the case with these car things. They're not going to cause that. So just be careful. It is a strong chemical. This will get rid of any kind of gummy surface. Let's say your, your snare drum stand, the rubber there is failing on that, you know, the mount where you mount the snare drum. I've had that happen. And then on the bottom of the rim, it'll leave a little sticky spot. So in that case, what you want to do is use the goo gun, get that off. And as, as fast as you can, use some of this polish and then wipe that off and it, it works great. So usually you have to leave the goo gun on there, you know, for about 30 seconds or so and then wipe it off. Now, one thing you want to do when you're dealing with these chemicals, even the car wax, is use some rubber gloves. I usually, usually I have a huge supply of these, but actually when the pandemic started, I gave away pretty much my whole supply because I know there was a shortage. So I don't have many left, but I did keep about 10 pair of these gloves. And these are great. These are the black ones. They're, they're nitrate gloves and they're heavy duty, so they don't tear easy. And whenever I'm cleaning anything, I always wear these so I don't get any problems with my skin. And, you know, I'm playing all the time and you don't want that to happen. So always wear some sort of rubber glove. And they're very sensitive, so you can still feel what's going on. So I totally recommend that. I don't know how easily you're going to find these now because the pandemic's ongoing. and uh, But you sh they should be back in circulation. A year ago, they, they, were, they were hard to come by. Okay? All right. So that's that. Now, the last thing we want to talk about is uh, really stubborn, stubborn rust. And we just talked about Gugan, and we just talked about Neverdell. If you have a really, really stubborn problem, you can use steel wool. All right? I hear that diminished cord going. <laughs> but you got to be really careful with this stuff. All right? Because it can cause some damage. Now, this is the super fine steel wool. I use two grades. Extra fine, which is 000. And super fine, 
which is the finest you can get, which is zero, 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 zero. It might even be edible. I don't know because it's so fine. But the whole idea is that it will take out some stubborn scratches and things. You know, like if you buy a used drum and, you know, there's a scratch you can't get out, you can try this. Now, again, you don't want to rub hard and you need to experiment first, uh, especially on the inside of a drum, to see how much damage it's going to do. But from my experience, this stuff is very, very, very fine. There's no sandpaper that is, is even close to as fine as this. All right, so, you know, this is what you'd want to use for that. And it works great. So, perfect example would be this rim where it, you know, it has some scratches. And just, just doing that, I don't know if you can see this on the camera, but all of a sudden it just got really nice and shiny, okay? But don't use it on black nickel. That's in good shape. So, the idea is to keep your drums in good shape with this kind of car wax polish which creates a coating which keeps things from getting scratched in the first place so that's the whole idea to do this so you never have to do what i just did with the steel wool all right you shouldn't have to do that if you keep your drums in good shape now this wax from my uh you know trials and tribulations will protect a drum from oxidizing in fact i did a little experiment years and years ago i have a as you know if you saw my snare drum videos i have like five or six ludwig superphonics dating from chrome over brass like 60 61 uh, all the way through the 70s all right and i would clean some of those especially the old ones now the chrome over brass they don't pit as bad but the later ones i mean you just look at them and they'd start pitting you know so i found that if you put some of this on there regularly that would keep the drums from actually oxidizing as bad. I had a coating on there, all right? So I have some superphonics that are very badly oxidized. I'll show you that in a separate video. And I have others that actually look almost brand new. And I really feel like it's because I was using this on some and not on the others. In fact, I know it is, because what else would have caused that? They're in the same environment. I was gigging with them all the time. They'd sit in my car overnight, everything. So this is a protective way to keep your drums uh, clean, and especially those old Ludwig Supers, man, like I said, they just oxidize all the time. They're known for that. But not to, not to COBs, chrome over brass. Uh, they won't do that as much, all right? So let's bring these fellows back up here. Oh, you know what? Before I go on, I'll show you a few more things so I don't forget. There's also another great cleaning tool. Uh, this is These are chamois or chamois. Uh, Q-tips. I used to use these to clean my, my Studer tape heads. I had a two-inch machine before the tape got too expensive and so no one would buy it. So I sold my two-inch machine, but I used to use these when I cleaned the machine and you had to clean those anal analog machines all the time. Pretty much daily, I would clean it. And uh, so I found out that these were great for cleaning small parts of a drum because it's got that chamois or chamois a coating which is basically sheepskin so it's not like a q-tip where a q-tip is going to leave you know threads of that cotton behind you don't want that these things do not shed so they're great and you can still find them uh the company that made these is called chemtronics i believe they're still around because people still use tape machines so uh you want you want to look these up and just get them and they last pretty long i mean i actually try to clean these and recycle them i can i wash them with some soap and then you can use them again. And they're great on hard to reach places if you don't want to take the drum apart. You just put a little of this cleaner on there, put it in there, and then go in there with another one that's clean and, and wipe it off. And there you go. So these are great. And again, don't use Q-tips because they're going to catch on things and your, your drum will start getting hairy after time. The only other thing I'll say is I have these really, really tiny, tiny kind of toothpick things. And I don't know if I can even get this open because I just bought these and my eyes are failing me. But here we go. I did get it open. All right. These are microscopic Q-tips. Now, I said not to use Q-tips, but in this case, I wouldn't be using it on any kind of thread. This is if I can't get to an area and it's it's pretty bad, you know, and I'll just go in there. I know this seems anal retentive and I'll clean it with these. So these are really, they're like acupuncture needles, okay? I rarely use them. So this whole pack will last me probably 10 years. I just finished my last pack, which lasted me 10 years. So we won't be using these today. <laughs> and, oh, I did want to show you one more thing. In the old days, when I was uh, young and stupid, I would use these cloths called Miracle Polishing Cloths. 
think I saw it on late night TV when I got home from a gig one night. So I bought a bunch of these. And the problem with these was, first of all, they smell like some sort of lemon attack. And the second thing is they have abrasive in them. So I cleaned one drum with them. I said, oh, this is working great. And then I looked under light and they had microscopic scratches, like I told you about not getting. So don't use these, okay? They look great. They might be good for just cleaning your tools. I do use them for that now. Um, you know, anything, my files, rust, my um, turning tools uh, for my lathe, I use them for that, things like that, because I don't care if they get scratched. But for drums, don't do it. Okay, so anything with any abrasive, no abrasive at all. You don't want anything with any, any kind of abrasive. Now, uh, let's just go over really quickly before I bring the drums back. The tools that I use to open up the drums, and I highly recommend that you do this. I've learned the hard way. So I'm a real um, champion of these electronic battery-operated tools, which are everybody uses now. No one's using plug-in uh, you know, drills anymore that I know of. But I like these small ones because, first of all, they're really light. And second of all, they, don't, they cannot give you enough torque to hurt anything, usually. And these Bosch, this is what I use, I use Bosch, you can change the torque to nothing. So if you're having a bad day and you're not thinking and you turn the wrong way, you have it reversed, you're not going to strip your lug out, which I've done, okay, with a drill like this when I was young and ignorant, which is powerful. That's a DeWalt. This is what I use when I do heavy construction. I have a whole bunch of these, okay? But they're not good for, for anything with drums. They're heavy. They won't fit inside a drum easily. And they're so powerful that you can do a lot of damage. So please don't use these. So what you want to do when you use these Bosch tools is uh, if you're using the drill, I have a, several of these. What you want to do is when you're removing the, um, the rods, you know, the lugs, you want to put it on the lowest possible torque setting. So there's no way in the world that even if you're, you know, um, not being smart and you have it in reverse, that you can cause damage. And uh, that's for these. Now, this is uh, sort of a torque wrench here. If you trust yourself and it's in reverse, you can really use this as much faster than these and just comes right out if you have to change ahead fast. But you cannot control the torque. so be really, really careful with this particular one. You see it? See the difference? Also, it doesn't have a chuck. This chuck is set, all right? So use something with a chuck. That's what I normally do. All right, I think that's it. Oh, last thing, forgetting. This is called a Dremel tool. I know a lot of you know what that is. This is kind of a giraffe version. And uh, this tool is great. It's like a dentist tool for cleaning anything uh, quickly. So I buy a bunch of these um, very soft cleaning uh, rods. They're, they're basically um, felt. I have a whole bunch of them. There's one on there now, a new one. And what I do, I'm looking for it now. Okay, yes, and I have some polish, a co polishing compound. So you can put that on there. Uh, it works great for tough areas once again. And you don't have to do a bunch of, you know, elbow grease there. You just put this on. It's pretty safe with these things on there. And I have a digital version so I can dial in the numbers. I usually use it on a, a 9 that fast. And it's great. Okay? So I'll have this mounted upside down, and I just go around and just do that. So you really, with all these tools here and these cleaners, I can clean anything quickly. All right, so that's what you want to do. And over time, you know, you can invest in this stuff and, um, you know, you'll have a collection of it. And finally, when you're doing any kind of drilling or screwing with uh, the drum there, uh, any kind of uh, metal work, anything, please use goggles, okay? Because you get something in your eye and you don't think it's going to happen, and it does, and it sucks. And it's I've done it, and it's terrible. And sometimes you got to go to the hospital. So always wear these protective glasses. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the drums apart, and uh, I don't think you want to see me do that. Well, if you do, you can you can write me, and I'll show you how I do that, which is the same as you do it. And then we'll be back, and uh, I'll show you how I polish these things up. So I've just taken the heads off, and I found a few things that I'm going to address. Now, I just got... Uh, 
bought this drum recently from a friend of mine, Gabe Batson in Montana. He's got some incredible drums always for sale that I see on Reverb and wherever else he sells them. He's a great guy, so uh, you might want to check him out. He sells expensive stuff, but it's totally worth it. So uh, this drum is a little bit dirty. It's got some things, so I think what I'm going to do in this case is take uh, the lug casings off, so the entire thing. And what I'll do is make sure that they get back to the same place. So I put a little label on them, and I do that, and I clean them separately. Because in back of them, I don't know if you can see that, we have a little bit of tarnishing starting to happen little bit of dirt and that's bad because that can if you leave that unchecked that can become a major problem the drums in great shape for being as old as it is and uh, you can see inside I don't know if you can see that signed by John Aldridge in there let's see if I can get this camera angle there so that that's how people know that he's the one who did it who engraved it so I'm gonna go ahead now and take these um, these lug casings off now, one thing I am also going to do, I've decided, these lugs are not in the best shape and they're kind of cheap. I'm going to replace them with these brass lugs that I have. I have um, lots of these that I've accumulated over the years, as you see. I'll go, usually on my drums that have brass plating, uh, I'll go and change the lugs. These are great. They'll last forever. They won't rust. They won't tarnish like this. And they match perfectly as you see with this die cast, this brass rim, okay? So it'll look better. Uh, the one thing you want to remember to do though is take the old lugs, when you take them off of there, and put them in a bag and label them. So if you ever sell the drum and a collector buys it, uh, they always want all the original parts. So uh, that's one thing you want to do. I'm not really a collector. Of course I collect drums, I got so many, but I play them all the time as well so uh, I always I'm you know making modifications to them as I see fit but I always keep the original rims if I change out the rims with die cast rims which I almost always do on all my drums uh, I will label the rims and all the parts to that drum with a serial number or whatever to recognize it and then when I sell that drum I'll put all the original parts on even the original heads so here are the original heads to this Black Beauty, the Ludwig Weathermaster, and they're in great shape. So I'm going to take these off, and what I'm going to do with this drum, I'm going to put calf heads on it, and I'll show you how I do that today. Uh, I like a real thin head. This is more like an ambassador instead of a diplomat uh, snare uh, head, which I which I normally do. That's the snare side head. So I'll use a really really thin um, calf head on there, and I'll put a calf head on the top too. All right, so those are the original heads, and I, again, I'll keep those and the lugs in a box. I'll label it, put it on the shelf, and then, you know, 100 years <laughs> down the line, when I'm ready to sell everything, or when I'm no longer here, at least my wife will know where everything is, and she can get everything back together. So we'll pause here again while I take off all these lugs and all the other hardware, and we'll be right back. So I've got all the hardware off now, and the shell looks great perfectly round sounds good no denting and I took all the hardware off except for the badge you can take that off but I totally don't recommend doing that okay uh, you'd have to punch it out and then re-rivet it this drum has two badges it has the um, the anniversary badge and then the Monroe badge on it so just examine the shell make sure especially around the rim Run your finger around it. You can take the gloves off now. And that it's nice and smooth and there's no denting. And this one is in great shape. No problems there. Now, like most of these drums, there's, there's no um, snare bed in it, okay? That's actually part of the sound of them, <laughs> that you don't have that snare bed. So there is none. So don't expect to find one. And as you see here, I have several little Tupperwares. I like to keep the hardware separate when I'm doing this. Uh, otherwise, you're really liable. Oh, there it is, see? For little parts to get lost, washers and stuff. And then you're going to have a hell of a time finding these things. So I always do it like this. I separate the parts into bins. Uh, I label things, like I said, when I need to. 
uh, you know, you need to be meticulous about this. You don't want to lose a part. Chances are on, on these old drums, it's going to be really hard to find a part if you lose it, misplace it. Who knows? Your wife vacuums it up. I mean, anything could happen. Or I vacuum it up. I do vacuuming too. Okay. All right. So now we're ready to polish this thing up. So since it's engraved, and I have a number of other engraved drums like my Clevelander and an old uh, Ludwig Elite um, well, Lady Elite, I should say. So you've got to be a little bit careful about that engraving, and you definitely don't want to use anything that sheds, like uh, cloth-wise. So I will apply the um, the wax here with um, a microfiber cloth, and I'll wait for it to dry into like a haze, and then I'll wipe it up with the really really soft uh, sheepskin cham chamois, okay, or chamois. One thing I do not use on any kind of nickel plated is this, like I, I talked about this earlier, this is great stuff, but don't use it on a nickel plated drum, anything with plating. It's, it's got a few chemicals in there that are a little more harsh than this, especially since it's used for cleaning wheels on cars, but it's great on chrome. Never had a problem with it on chrome, but I have had a few little suspect things on a black nickel drum. And one thing you could do on a black nickel drum, if it's inside and out coated, do the inside first, a little area just to check it to make sure. Uh, but again, for any kind of black nickel, I would advise against using the mother's mag and aluminum. Maybe some of you can chime in. You've had luck, but I just don't want to take any chances. Okay. But I know for a fact, this stuff is great on black nickel because I've been using it for, for a while. So uh, let me just show you how I do this. I do one little section at a time. Again, the smell of bananas will, you know, be all over your studio <laughs> for a while. I like it. You might not. All right. So here's a spot that's particularly bad. I don't know if that's going to come across on the camera, but I'm going to start there. And what I do is just, just like this, it's a little too much I put on there, but I'll just do that and spread it out evenly. Just like that. Now normally where the heads go, there's going to be a little bit of scuffing. That doesn't really matter because the heads are going to cover that again. So I'm not too concerned about that. I am really concerned though about right around here, the lip, which catches a lot of dust. All right. And that's going to be the first place probably that's going to start oxidizing. And again, this has been engraved beautifully. Obviously, the uh, John Aldrich is an artist. And this will not shed and catch in that engraving. See, it wants to, but it won't. Any kind of cotton cloth, uh, you know, don't use a paper towel, <laughs> tissue, that, you know, that, a sock, anything like that will get stuck in that engraving and the drum will, it'll be hard to get that out. Okay, it gets a little hairy. So then I'll sit there and enjoy the fumes of banana for a minute and let that dry, usually about 30 seconds. And I'm patient. Sometimes I'll just put on some music and just chill. It's very actually relaxing to do this. And I'm not in any kind of hurry at this point. And sometimes I do two drums at once, I'll, uh, or I'll do like a rim, and I'll do that and let that dry. I can do that now. Actually, let's take this out. And the rims, you can pretty much do almost the whole thing in one one scoop because it's it's... No, it doesn't have anything that's going to catch. These rims are in really good shape, actually. See a few spots of tarnishing. We're going to address that in a minute with the Dremel tool. Now, the drums that tarnish the most are copper drums. I have a Marvin Smitty Smith drum, a few of those. I love it. It's a pearl drum. Uh, great drum, but it will tarnish. Bronze will get a little weird. Some of the old sonar drums. I'm going to do a different, a separate video on copper and bronze. Uh, bell brass, another problem. I've managed to keep all my bell brass, copper, and bronze drums almost looking like new from doing this like once a year. And I've seen some others, especially when I'm, you know, perusing on eBay or something, and you look at those, these old sonar drums, especially the cast bronze, and they look like they've been through a war. I don't know how they got that way, but it's terrible because they are beautiful drums. All right, so wait for that to dry, and now this should be dry. So then you take your chamois, and you, you're going to go in one direction. See? Wow, look at that. Just all that came off. And you can actually sometimes just see it on the cloth. I don't rub back and forth. I go in one direction. 
and then there is some black on there that means there's some dirt coming off and just nice and easy and it is literally unless you get some dirt on the cloth you know some some abrasive material it's impossible to scratch with this stuff it is like the softest stuff you can get and that's looking great and there's gonna there's some stubborn spots sometimes so you you might have to go over them again but this is just doing just wonders for this it's beautiful I can see myself in there clearly now I found once oh well that's where the um yeah that's where the mm -hmm. uh, the other end of the strainer is so yeah that's going to be a little bit funky But that is just a mirror shine right there. Beautiful. Okay, I don't know if you can see that, but it looks great. Now these drums are prone to fingerprints and all that too. And the acids in your in your hand and your oils, the oils in your hand, especially that. So doing this kind of wax protects against that as well. Uh, I already said that I'm um, cleaning these earlier. I took them off. These are in the worst shape of anything on the drum. They have started to tarnish. So we're going to hit these with the Dremel tool if this doesn't work. And these look like they're brass, but uh, that is tarnish for sure. It's gotten in there. And sometimes when it gets in there, I know, you know, it's a little bit of a character. It's a patina. But sometimes when it gets in there, you cannot get it. It's part of the metal, and it's just, it's just oxidation. Let's try. I think I'm going to try this wheel stuff on this because this is brass and it should be fine on that let's see the banana stuff first yeah so there's some oxidation on on this particular lug it's not bad again it's uh you know if you look at the old really old early early um 20th century black beauties i mean part of the charm is that patina that they get on there all over there let's try it so Again, it's not. It's. I'm not worried because it's not going to get any worse uh, for this particular thing. Okay, so you just take a little, put it on there, and then now you're gonna. For this, you're gonna rub back and forth. See if it comes off. Oh, it is coming off. Okay, and actually on the on the bottle it says if you don't see black, stop. <laughs> so, it's uh. It is taking off. Yeah, it's good, actually. Better. Yeah, this stuff is amazing. But again, don't use it on the nickel plating. Brass, it's great. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Actually, that's a lot better. So yeah, I'm going to use this on all of these. and Because uh, it, it needs a little extra to get rid of some of this. A um, little extra punch to get rid of some of this oxidation and dirt I'm not sure why these are so dirty and the rest of the drum isn't so bad probably because it was in a case it did come with a case that's the original case it came in it could be from bouncing around in that case but that's beautiful shiny nice I can live with that all right so that's how I'm going to do it so sometimes a little experimentation now normally on these drums especially Ludwig's the strainers are really the worst this one's filthy so again, I'm going to try the back part of the top and see what happens with this. It should be fine. And it, this is usually the most scratched up part of the drum because it's the part of the drum that's handled the most. Just like when you look where, uh, you know, uh, when you open your car door and you see all scratches around the handle, eventually, uh, that's actually working great. Yeah, a lot of dirt's coming off of there. That's where you're going to get the dirtiest part in your car because your, your hand is there all the time and there's always kind of dirt on your hand or gloves or whatever. But uh, literally, this just basically made this look brand new. So, uh, again, that's this uh, Mother's Wheel Polish. But again, not for the drum that's nickel-plated around there. I wouldn't because this stuff works fine. The Meguiar's 26 is perfect. All right? So I'm going to go ahead and polish all this up. And then we're going to throw a couple calf heads on there and uh, see how it looks. We'll be back. 
So I've got the drum clean. Everything worked out good. It's a little bit of tarnishing in a few spots. Nothing to cry over. It's common with these drums that that happens over time. But overall, the shell looks like it's in great shape and cleaned up nice. So now I have some calf heads. As I've said in my other videos, these, these are Lafima calf heads. This is what I prefer to use. Uh, they have metal hoops, so they stay very, very stable. The wooden hoops tend to warp all over the place. This one, I already uh, wet it down last night, and I tightened it up with a blow dryer. So it's already pretty tight. There's not a lot of throw on these Black Beauties. In other words, the, um, the rim is not going to sit too far down. So I wanted to make sure the head was a little bit tight before I put it on there. And, you know, as with all calf heads, your mileage is going to vary because the thickness varies within the head itself. Every spot is a little bit different because it's a, you know, it's an organic thing. Uh, plastic head does not have those issues. So we're going to start out with the top. And normally when I do this, put on calf heads, I do one head at a time to get it in tune. Uh, like I've said before, normally I just put the logo straight up like that. Uh, so it's facing right between these two, like that. These two lugs, in other words. And then we clean up the rims. They came out great, beautiful, nice and shiny. And we'll put the, this back on here. And it fits great. Now that's not always the case with calf, all calf heads, especially the older ones. If they're molded to a drum, an old drum, like a Radio King or something, or an old Ludwig, that wasn't necessarily um, you know, round to begin with, they could be distorted. All right, so that we have that. And then we're gonna have our new lugs and we're gonna put those on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and tighten that thing up. And i um, not sure I'm gonna use this head yet. Uh, it's pretty tight. I might even have to wet it down and loosen it. But I do have one more head, now that I think of it, that I'd like to try, it's a newer one. Um, that's a little thicker. Uh, the problem with the calf heads is you can break them very, very easily, depending on the time of year. If it's summer and if it's humid and they get looser and looser as a gig goes on, you go right through them. They're expensive. So I think what I'm going to do is use a little bit of a thicker head on this because I want to try using it for my, some other things besides just, uh, just playing jazz. So we'll be right back with that. Okay, so I've, I've got a little bit of a thicker head. You see this? It's an older one that I have. Just um, after feeling this and seeing, I, I think I basically got it too tight, and that's what happens with a calf head. So I wet it, and I dried it, and it seems to have taken on a life of its own, which is fine, because I'm going to wet it down again and straighten it out. The way you can do that, even with a metal rim, it can get a little wobbly there you see that you put it between two heavy objects in my case I take two pieces of plywood I wet the head down put the head on the piece of plywood put another piece of plywood on top of it uh, with a towel on top of the calf head so it doesn't mess up the head and just leave it there for a few days and then it'll basically dry straight again can't do that with a wood hoop it doesn't work so uh, but that's what happens when you over tighten the head it just gets a little bit um, warped like that Okay, so that's that, and you see this new head here, well, the old, new old head, and what I'm going to do now is I've already put the lugs on, and when I used to look, uh, put the lugs on, I use this lug lube, LP makes it, it's basically oil, and I put it in uh, all the lug casings so everything's nice and smooth, and I'll use a timpani mallet to check the pitch, so right now, that's what a calf head sounds like when it's slow, it's pretty amazing. All right, sounds like a frame drum, a boran. So I'm just going to go around. I tighten it up a little and do it by feel and tighten this thing up. Three, four, four. So it's a 10 lug drum. And I'll keep checking it. See if it's down here. Anyway, um, so I'm looking to get a little bit higher. Almost an A is what I'm looking for. That's normally what I tune my snare drums to.
drums rattled a little, which is to be expected. That's much better. And then later on, when I get the bottom head on, I'll go all around it. Actually, that's pretty good right now. And I'll get a, a good tuning that I'm happy with. And then it's going to take a little while for this head to sit right. This head has a little bit of a dent in it. I think I, I'm guilty of that. <laughs> a little over ambitious one day, and I made a little dent in a... You can actually dent a calf head, believe it or not. And you can try to take that out with some heat and a match, but be careful. It's not as easy to do as with a plastic head. I'm going to give it one more go around just because I know it's going to stretch and then we'll put the bottom head on. Now with calf heads it's important when you're done playing them, especially if there's going to be a lot of heat on overnight, or the room's going to get dry, is to take them down. Otherwise you'll wake up in the morning sometimes and one or two will be split. That happens with timpani heads sometimes, calf heads. I'm going to turn off that snare drum wherever it is, I'll find it. Alright, so we'll be right back. I'll put on the bottom head and then we'll get the snares on there. One thing I wanted to show you is that these uh, bottom heads, believe it or not, calf, need to be a lot thinner. So in other words, it's kind of like a diplomat snare head like cellophane. You see how thin that is? They're hard to find so you have to specify if you buy these that you want a snare head. Otherwise you'll be stuck with a bottom head that's like an ambassador thickness and it's not going to be sensitive at all. As opposed to this is the other head I was going to use. It's much thicker, at least twice as thick. So make sure you specify that if you're going to get it, use a bottom calf head. Most people don't do that. I like to have both top and bottom calf when I, when I do that. So uh, I've already put the lug lube in there, and then we're going to place this head on there. And this is going to be a little, need a little more tightening, or I should say a lot more tightening than the previous head. And here's the new snare rim. Came out great. Not new, but newly polished. And one thing you got to make sure with these calf heads is that they sit perfectly, and these this sits perfectly. Once again, that's why I really, really prefer these Lafema metal hooped heads. Never had a problem with one of them sitting perfectly on the drum. And then I'll go around and take these new brass lugs and or tension rods, whatever you want to call them, and finger tighten them. I did this with the top head. I didn't show you that, but I was I did that before we ro I rolled the camera. And I'll just go in there after I put the lug lube in. And I'll go all the way around, just finger tight. Now, I will show you this whole process now. It's going to be a little bit tedious. But I'll go as fast as I can. The one thing you want to do is make sure the rim is straight. So in other words, it's not angled with the... Uh, the tension rods. Sometimes it wants to pull a particular way, especially with a calf head. That again is, uh, these are the best calf heads you can get in my opinion, but they are not manufactured to the same tolerances as a, as a Remo head or an Aquarian head or, you know, an Evans head, which are basically punched out on a computer controlled machine. These are all hand tucked and then stamped in the metal. All right, so now that we have it all hand tightened, what I do is I go around with the key, and I'm not doing star tuning yet. I'm just going to do it by feel and get everything about the same tension. I'm just using my own kind of the feel of it to get that, and then, then I'll start. And you'll notice the head will, just like any head, it'll start to tighten, but it won't crack like a plastic head does. So I don't stand on these like I showed you in my drum tuning video. I do not stand on calf heads because there's no glue to crack, okay? All right, so this is what it looks like when you first put it on. So it's very wrinkly, and the goal is going to be to get those wrinkles out. And again, it's different than a regular head, um, plastic head, to do that. Sometimes you really got to work hard, and even 
you might have you might have to tighten one of the lugs that's close to a wrinkle a little more i've had to do that so here we go i'll do a full turn two three four All right, now what I'm going to do, and this is a little different than what you're used to, I'm going to go around again clockwise, and I'm going to get the tension out of So, because again, the head might be a little uneven. So we're going to seat this head now by going around and just feeling where we're at. See, this one's a little looser. This one's a little looser. That one's a lot looser. And this one's a lot looser. And there we go. Okay, now what I'm going to do is just put a little pressure Again, it's not going to crack, and you're still going to have some spots that are loose. That Don't worry about that, because, again, the calf head is the nature of it. It's thicker in some places and thinner in the other, especially uh, these really thin heads. These calf heads are so hard to find, and you're not ever going to break one if it's a snare side head, uh, unless you play it upside down or it drop or falls on something so it literally lasts forever so you might spend a lot of money for one but again once it's on there it's it's pretty much forever unlike the top head which will break and, and can break if you hit it too hard uh, so let's go ahead now and do the start tuning again and you know what we're going to start down here one two three four five Eight, nine, ten. All right. So we still have wrinkles, see? So at this point, what I'll do is I'll literally take that lug and I'll tighten it just another turn, like that. All right. Now eventually, it's gonna. Um, I got some of that lug lube on here. Let me get that off the oil on this head. Eventually, what's going to happen, it's going to change with the weather. So when it dries up, we have um, unseasonably warm weather here today for it being in the middle of February. It's about 70 degrees in North Carolina. So uh, it's a little bit humid, believe it or not, in the middle of winter. So tomorrow is supposed to cool down again, so I'm going to have to loosen all these up to be sure that there's no problems. Okay, so I'm going to do it again. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And we lost our our bubbles, so we're good now. Okay? And then I'm gonna listen to the drum. And again, it's rattling because of the um, the strainer. There's no snares. And then we'll listen to the top. Alright? Same pitch, pretty much. That's what you want. Very, very, very close, all right? And close to an A as well. So that's my starting point. Now, uh, as I, well, after I put the snares on, if I, I start playing it, I will make adjustments to it. And every day, uh, if you use calf heads, the drum's gonna sound a little different, which I like. And you just, just tighten it up, and um, you know, that's, that's part of the fun for me. You know, you can have really great sounding drum days with calf heads. But if you want consistency, and you don't wanna mess with tuning, don't use calf heads. Uh, but it's a great sound. It's a great feel. I've been using a calf head for all the uh, classical snare drum etudes I've been posting. And the feel of it is, it's harder to play because it kind of fights back. But the feel of that calf head is just so great. It, it's like, I don't know how to explain it if you've not played one. It's like playing an old cave Zildjian. You know, it just kind of sucks you in. And it's it's all warm and cozy. <laughs> okay. So uh, you, should, you should try one if you can. Um, there's a company called Earth Tone. I think they're from Brazil. They make, they're decent. They're decent. I have a few of those. In fact, I just got some for my Gretsch Centennial kit, and I'm going to put those on there. I'll do a video on that because I'm getting ready to do some more videos with that kit. And uh, I'm going to use all calf heads because we're coming into the best calf head time of year where it starts, you know, it's not too cold. It's not too hot. That's the springtime. So about three months there is perfect for calf heads. So uh, anyway, I'll put the snares on. And then um, I'll go ahead and do this other drum. Pretty much know what's going on now. The only thing I'm going to show you when I do this other drum, I'll take it all apart and clean it and do all that. I'll put it together and I'm going to show you uh, a little bit of a different head combination and how I tune a six and a half because uh, this is the six and a half 
Remember, that's the Steve Ferroni drum we started with. And this is the uh, five inch or five and a half uh, Ludwig. All right, so we'll be back. So I just shined up this Steve Ferroni snare drum and it's literally like new. Good old Pearl. The quality I think is unmatched. So this shell is pretty old. I mean, it's from the 90s, so it's probably at least 20 years old, at least. Probably 25 years old or so. And like I said, no tarnishing, perfect. Now I can't say the same for the Black Beauty, the coat, the um, nickel plating is not as well done, I'd have to say that. Although it's a gorgeous drum as well. So this is just coming out beautiful, you can see the shine. And again, that's with this, just this, this um, number 26, Meguiar's. Now, um, what we're going to do with this is we're going to go ahead and polish up these lug casings, okay, and get them back on there. But what I, I did want to show you before we jump to the next part, because this video is basically about giving new life to older drums, and I'm sure all of you out there have a lot of older drums. We're going to talk about heads real quick. Because the next time you see this drum, these heads will be on. We've already gone over that. All right, so these are the old heads. We had an, an ambassador that was beaten senseless, pretty much. And then we had an ambassador snare, which is a very thin snare head, not as thin as a diplomat. Now, uh, for rock, when I'm playing heavy, I will use a very thin ambassador, obviously a snare head. It's not as thin as a diplomat, once again, but over time, when you're hitting that drum, you know, a lot of backbeats, they'll wear out pretty quick if you use a diplomat. This one is completely worn out. You see the, the snare engraving on there. It's got some problems when I bought it. It had all that. I haven't changed this head. So, so we'll change that out with a new one, and that alone will help a lot. And normally I'll change the bottom heads, and I said this on my drum tuning video, every Two times I changed the top heads, I'll change the bottom heads. So with snare drums, that's probably, with plastic heads, that's probably twice a year, unless they're being used heavily. Now on the top of this drum, I'm going to try something different. Normally I'd use an ambassador coated, but I like these skin tone heads a lot, these Remo skin tone heads. They're a little darker, and this is a bright drum, being that it's, you know, brass and all and very heavy. So I'm going to try this head on there, and... Um, the next video I'll do will be short, it'll be separate from this, but I'll play you the, uh, the calf head on the Ludwig Black Beauty, and, as well as this with the plastic heads, but with the skin, skin tone head. So I'm going to go ahead and um, put this thing back together and tune it up, and we're going to say bye bye for today. But let's just recap real fast. First of all, we'll put these down here, never use anything abrasive on your drums to clean them on any finish be it uh, a wrap or wood uh, or metal the only abrasive thing you should ever use is to get rust off of rims and normally i'll use a very very fine steel wool it's got four zeros on it okay the one above it you can use for really really tough spots but don't start using it on black nickel coating because you'll see the scratches and then make sure the cloths you're using are very soft. Again, I like these cheap microfiber thin cloths. They're very, very inexpensive and you can wash them. And then for polishing, you can't go uh, wrong with these sheepskin or chamois or chamois or chamois. I heard someone say that. Uh, they're kind of, you know, it's, it's real, it's sheepskin. So for polishing, they're just the best. They're extremely soft. They'll never ever leave any scratches. So anything you have, really, doesn't even have to be drums on your car. Anything you want to shine, they're great. Okay? So you see that. And I usually carry one of these anyway in my, my drum uh, case, one of my drum cases. 
and for a gig I'll just get all the dust off if they've been sitting there in the cases for a while which is the case these days <laughs> all right so thanks so much I'm sure you'll have questions please email me we'll do another video on some other drums especially copper doing those because I have some I, those I have to work on and the superphonics but I'll do a video shortly um, here that you'll see me playing on these two drums I'm not sure how to how I'm gonna present it with the drum setter by itself then you could hear what they sound like. All right, so take care and be safe. Bye-bye.